Hey there, I am Dr. Will Lee here with Five with Dr. Lee, and I am actually today talking about a new book uh, that I'm super excited about. Um, it is called Fiber Fueled, and it's actually a cookbook, Fiber Fueled cookbook. Uh, my good friend Will Bolsowitz is the author, and I'm going to have him on as a special guest. So let's see if we can find him. Here he is. He's coming on board anytime now. And I want to talk about all the things that are, all the great stuff. Hey. Hello, hello. How you doing? I'm great. It's good to see you, my man. Good to see you. Well, listen, I, I was just introducing people, my audience, to uh, the Fiber Fueled Cookbook, which I received uh, and have been reading. It's not that thick a book. Um, and what I love about it is that, um, you know, I, I love to cook. It's got super, uh, super easy recipes that are beautifully photographed easily written anybody can actually find them appealing so you know when i look when i look for something in a cookbook i'm looking for pictures and i'm looking for ease and i want it to be super appealing um and uh, uh and i know that you and i have been talking about the the coming of this book uh out of uh, your fiber fueled uh book and so i wanted you to come on today so we could have a conversation about a couple of things number one i wanted to talk about like okay how did you go from your first book to the cookbook. And number yep. two, I want to kind of do a little bit of a deep dive and talk about histamine and histamine based foods and, and, you know, and, and what, what, what can we do that's really practical? Like what do, what do, what's the take home message out of it? So you want to, you want to kind of give us all a little background of, of, of where you came from in terms of your first book and, and uh, which maybe a little bit about your background too, just sort of like, how does, how does a doctor like you and me get involved with writing a book and how does that book lead us to the next book? Yeah. First of all, this is a great book. If you guys haven't grabbed it, you, you probably have, but if you haven't, you need to grab this book, Eat to Beat Disease. Um, you know, Will, I think uh, much like you, all right, this was not some sort of strategic plan to become an author. Uh, I certainly didn't view myself as being a serial author. The sequence of events you know, just to kind of like quickly move through it so that we can jump to other big things that we want to talk about. The sequence of events is that quite simply, I come from a very academic background, Georgetown for med school, Northwestern for residency, the University of North Carolina was on a grant from the NIH uh, publishing papers. But 10 years ago, I was sick. And being sick actually turned out to be the most important part of my education. Because I needed a way to fix my own health issues and discovered that my education at these wonderful institutions and with like literally world-class mentors, I still didn't know how to fix my own problems. By the way, for those who are wondering, I was 50 pounds overweight, metabolically unbalanced, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and from a mood perspective in a horrible place, very anxious, honestly depressed. And what ended up being the solution was unexpected because if I knew it, I would have just done it. It was changing my diet and discovering the power that exists by like making small, simple, sustainable choices, but then coming back and doing it again tomorrow. And this transformed my life. And then I started asking questions. Why was I not taught this? Is there any literature? Well, much like you and the way that you referenced Eat to Beat Disease, my first book had 600 references and my cookbook has 400 references. <laughs> That's <laughs> perhaps a new world record for a cookbook. So I, um, I'm thumbing through science. it. I'm, I'm thumbing through it right now because, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the one thing that is so important for everyone listening is th we're all wondering who are the voices that we can trust. And what you've just uh, relayed, I think, to everyone is that you have a, a, a in-depth background and you were confronted with a personal problem that your background couldn't solve. And that led you using your education and using your determination to try to figure out the answer that you would then give to everyone else. That's exactly right. And so, so I, you know, I believe like science is my compass. 
So I turned to the medical literature and was shocked to discover, Will, that there are thousands of studies showing us and explaining what actually happened with my own body and that healing through nutrition is actually very possible. And so this um, created a voracious appetite within me to learn more on this topic because it, ch it changed my life. It saved me. So I started uh, studying at night and then I would go into the clinic the next day with my patients and we would learn together. So I was, I'm sure, quite clumsy in the very beginning and how I was doing this. But my patients stuck with me and we figured it out. And next thing you know, this is like a snowball gaining momentum. And patients are having transformations. And I'm watching this happen, these miracles in my clinic and saying, it is not enough for me to be one-on-one -on -one with these people who can afford to come and see me when the entire world deserves to hear this. Independent of like, I don't care if you have money and I certainly don't have the time to see all of you, but I do want to share this information. That's the really one of the best reasons, uh, and I think you and I share this, to write a book is to really be able to share that information. If you're going to take the time to explain it to one person and see the benefit, then it, it's inevitable that, you know, the next step is to say, how do I impact more people? I, one of my mentors, you know, called it the ripple effect. You know, when you throw a stone into a pond and you sort of see all the ripples forming. And so I think that's really what fiber fuel did. It actually you know, took you from a uh, well, uh, a, a, a physician, a clinician with a great reputation in your own practice into really a national and international force. I know you started to do work with Zoe, which is um, really focused on the microbiome uh, and health. And uh, you also uh, are uh, like a rock star when it comes to um, your tribe and social media. And I want to introduce the people who follow me uh, to the work you're doing, because I I think it's so important. So why don't we dive into the fiber fueled cookbook? Because, you know, I love cookbooks. I'm, a, I'm like a, I mean, I'm a collector of cookbooks. If you took a look around where I am right now, it's filled with cookbooks and yours happens to be on the top of the pile, not because it actually just came in. Uh, so everyone should actually buy it, but actually it's something that I, uh, I'm geeking out on. The reason I'm geeking out on it is because I'm a scientist and I love when you're explaining, um, not only to the general public, but to someone like me, you're not talking down to people. You're actually bringing everybody up. And so even for me, uh, you know, I'm a scientist to read through it. I'm reviewing things that I know. I'm um, asking new questions uh, based on my own background. And the way it's written is just like perfect for everyone. So, you know, I thought maybe you want to kind of talk about what's in your book. And then I'd love to jump into the histamine chapter because everyone knows histamine from antihistamine, which you take during allergy season at this right. time of the year. But I want to, you know, it's something I've always wondered myself about because I met somebody in college who actually had a terrible allergy, allergic reaction to tomatoes and strawberries. And so I thought maybe we can use that as a jumping point. But talk, t let everyone know what is in this baby here. Okay. So the, the story goes like this. Um, I, I did not have a plan for a second book. You know that. You and I were on the phone. By the way, for those of you who don't know, when I found out that I was a New York Times bestselling author, the first person to call me was this guy right here. All right. And we had a nice conversation. He's been, he's been uh, an important and valued uh, part of my life. Fiber Fueled was a passion project. I want to shine a light on this revolutionary science that's occurring right now that is transforming how we think about the human body and the most important part is not even human. And the way that we make that work so well is through dietary fiber, which 95% of us are not consuming, right? So that was the story, but people came out of the woodwork and they said to me, you know, I loved your book. You inspired me. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm on board, but I don't feel well when I eat this way. Okay. There's reasons for this, and this is what I spend, you know, my job as a gastroenterologist has been is to help people with these types of issues. So let me stop being an author and let me be a doctor and let me use this opportunity that I have because of the success of my first book to write a book designed for healing. 
this is basically, they call it a cookbook, but what if we called it the fiber fields protocol? Because you easily could. And, you know, basically it's 11 chapters. There's recipes in four of the chapters. The rest of them are me providing empowerment and education. And if you followed the book, chapter by chapter, I'm actually guiding you on a healing journey that like I'm taking you inside my head and I'm showing you how I would approach digestive health issues step by step. And, and it's, and so, it's got some gorgeous pictures too. You know, it's really, so, uh, it's really important. I think for a guide not to be just boring text, but to really have some wonderful pictures. And that's what you've actually put in here. Well, you know what's going to happen, Will? This is what happens, man. Someone grabs this book. Day one, you take it home. Okay, this is your new uh, issue of Us Weekly. Right. Like, turn your brain off, take your shoes off, and just flip through and look at the beautiful photos and maybe fold over the pages with the recipes that you want to cook. Okay, now your job for the rest of this week is let's cook some food and let's have some fun, enjoy some delicious meals. But then the third part, is you get to sit down with me and I wrote 11 chapters and I want to empower you with knowledge that I believe could transform your life. And that to me is the special part of this book is yes, it is a cookbook, but it's actually a cookbook that is completely designed for healing. That's what it's about. I love that. I mean, and, and you know, the, the, the funda fundamentals is really about fiber, isn't it? Because I mean, that's really one of the, areas that you focus on, but it's not just fiber. I mean, as doctors, we know that there's very rarely a black and white, simple thing that if you removed it, everything is all fixed. There's uh, the body works in really complex ways. And when you're talking about the, the gut microbiome, uh, you know, which is the recipient of the food that we put in our mouth, right? What we put upstairs goes, trickles all the way down. And if it's good for our, uh, uh, our bacteria, they thank us for it. And if it's bad for our bacteria, we pay, we pay the price. Right. Um, right. So, so, you know, I, I, I was so excited to see there was a whole section on histamine. Now I remember from medical school, you know, histamine is made from an amino acid histidine that actually um, is present in all of our bodies. We, we need it. And in fact, histamine is something that most people think about for allergies, right? You like, oh, um, you don't have to be a scientist to actually have hay fever, ragweed or pollen or whatever, sleep with the windows open, you got runny nose, stuffy nose, and you want to take, what do you, where do you reach for, uh, you know, is into the medicine cabinet, you take your antihistamine. So do you want to kind of like help everybody explain, like, what does that have to do with the diet? And how do you know if you have a problem with it? And, and before you would want to fix it? Yeah, so, uh, you know, as, you, as you've already alluded to, histamine is actually a normal part of the human body. And when we are our most healthy version of ourselves, we, we have histamine in our blood. But um, it's a signaling molecule, and there are these histamine receptors. And it, like anything else, if it falls out of balance and you overstimulate those histamine receptors, you will manifest symptoms that you don't want. And this is where, like, you know, these antihistamines like Claritin and Zyrtec come in. Um, because those people that have seasonal allergies, they are overstimulating those histamine receptors and suffering consequences. So that's what the pollen is doing. We're breathing it in, we're getting into our eyes, and it's making us swell, uh, uh, we weep fluid, uh, stuffy nose, congestion, and, and that's the overstimulation by something in nature. And that's an alert, yeah, and that's an allergic phenomenon. So those seasonal allergies are basically histamine is being released by your immune system in response to this external thing, in, the, in this case, pollen, or it could be pet dander or whatever it may be, this external thing um, stimulates your immune system, it releases histamine, and then you get this excessive histamine reaction. Okay, but here's the thing. You made a very important point in the beginning that most people probably didn't catch. Histamine is produced by microbes. Histamine is produced by microbes from the amino acid histidine. All foods contain histidine. All life, which basically makes up our food, contains microbes. So all foods contain histamine because microbes will create histamine. The classic foods that are high in histamine 
are fermented foods because the microbes are producing it. Another example would be fish. So if you caught a fish, if you were like out there in the boat and you ate that fish, you would be perfectly fine. There's no way you would have a histamine reaction. But the problem is that's not how it works in the real world. The fish is caught and then it's like three weeks later, you buy it at Whole Foods and you take it home and then you cook it. And it's enriched with histamine at this point. So you can get histamine in your diet um, let me point out the plants that are relevant because there's four main plants that people need to, to know about. Uh, spinach, tomatoes, eggplants, and you, you're going to be a little bit mad at this one, Will, but avocados. All right, so these four plants tend to be our high histamine foods. And um, if you consume a diet with a large burden of histamine in it without you even knowing it, then you can actually through dietary means overstimulate these histamine receptors in the body. So this leads to the manifestation of symptoms. Now I'm gonna actually list a whole bunch of symptoms and the exercise here, cause we have quite a few people here with us right now. Uh, the exercise here is for you guys, as you hear me say this, ask the question, do you have at least two of these symptoms? All right. So hang on a second. Before you go into the list, let's frame it up. Basically, you're eating foods. They're going to go down into your gut. Some of those foods may have histamine just because, of, because they're food. And then you've got gut bacteria that can actually generate even more histamine. Now, histamine doesn't necessarily cause you a problem many people, maybe even most people can actually, everyone can tolerate a little bit of histamine. Yes. The question of whether it matters to you, whether or not you need to actually pay attention to your symptoms based on, based, is based on, well, whether or not you have the symptoms at all, right? Do you have a That's problem? That's exactly right. Now you need to know, you need to ask that question, do I have a problem? So, all right, let's, let's have that framed up now and let's go ahead and what are the symptoms people need to think about? All right, so if you have two of these symptoms, I'm gonna tell you what to do next after we're done. So just pay attention, do you have two? So the number one symptom of histamine intolerance is gas and bloating. How common is that? <laughs> so in addition, other digestive symptoms could include um, discomfort, cramping abdominal pain, acid reflux, nausea, uh, diarrhea, constipation. But let's go outside of the gut. I'm gonna start at the top, I'm gonna to work my way down headaches, migraines, brain fog, runny nose, congestion, sinusitis, sore throat. I'm gonna do the skin. Uh, so rash, eczema, hives, flushing, cardiac, uh, rapid heartbeat, palpitations, high blood pressure, uh, lightheadedness, and then uh, some, a couple of miscellaneous, fatigue, um, irregular menstrual cycle, pain with menstrual cycle, like excessive pain. Okay. Now, here's the so problem. Hang on. So, 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 so here, so hang on. You just actually went through essentially whole body symptoms, some yes. of which are very generalized. And I think yes. the reason is because histamine receptors the, the kind of the proteins on top of our cells that actually respond to that signal, the, the histamine signal are present everywhere. And so whether or not you're, how sensitive you are to it is one factor and then how much of the signal you have is the other factor, right? Yes, exactly. And, and the fact that you have a couple of these symptoms does not mean that you necessarily have histamine intolerance, but it opens up the possibility that maybe you do. What if you do? Now, here's the issue. The healthcare system is not designed to give you an answer to this question for a couple of reasons. Number one, we don't have good testing, meaning where there's no blood test, there's no poop test, there's no CAT scan, all right? The second problem is that you go to in healthcare and you come see me, I'm your gastroenterologist, and you say, Dr. B, I'm having bloating and a runny nose and migraines. And I go, cool, I'll help you with the bloating, Go see an allergist and a neurologist and they'll take care of those issues, right? What happened to integrating the whole person? 
What if there was one diagnosis that pulled it all together? We, we learned in medical school, as you know, Will, about Occam's razor, which basically means that usually there's one diagnosis instead of three diagnoses, right? Simple, complex things are often simple if you actually think about what actually unites everything. Exactly. So anyway, how, how can you then know whether or not you have histamine intolerance? Here's the answer. You eat a low histamine diet. And if these symptoms radically transform, then we have just identified that you have histamine intolerance and we have potentially changed your life. So what, it, what you actually wrote in your book is a methodology, kind of a protocol to first avoid the histamine rich foods, right? That essentially it's sort of, um, it's not a cleanse, that's the wrong term. What you're trying to do is to sort of filter out those foods that might be bad actors. Um, you still have a ton of foods that you can actually eat, so you're not starving yourself. Um, yep. And then you're, you're inviting people as part of this protocol in your fiber field cookbook to then pay attention to the body, listen to the body, and then start to add things back. And it is not a permanent elimination. We are moving. We are always striving to add these foods back. Sometimes we will take two steps backwards so that we can take 10 steps forwards. That's part of the process. Um, but what we do is we give you, so if I said to you as a doctor, eat low histamine, well, what does that even mean? But instead, what I could do is I could hand you 26 recipes and you can choose which ones you wanna eat. Do you wanna have the mango blueberry smoothie or the sweet potato waffles for breakfast? What would you rather have? How about for lunch, we do a soup and a salad. You could have the summer sunburst salad or the rainbow farro salad with tahini dressing. And for soup, I got the roasted cauliflower soup and the sweet, the sweet corn and pepper gazpacho. And then for dinner, there's the gado gado quinoa bowl. There's the sweet potato shawarma bowl. There's the mango burrito bowl. What do you want? So it's Listen, like- I'm, 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 a, I'm a foodie and I haven't heard anything that you just described that smacks of deprivation. So that's the no. other thing that I think that when people think about health, healthy food cookbooks is all about elimination and kind of knuckling down to that like hardcore- unpleasant diet that you know you sort of have to be a slave to what you're saying is in fact this sets you free because yes. it allows your body to actually um uh, uh rest and rejuvenate regenerate from any histamine abuse that might have been occurring so then you can actually figure out what it is that you're able to tolerate the first step to healing is always first understanding the nature of the problem that you're trying to fix Right. So if you were never diagnosed with histamine intolerance, how could you possibly create a plan to fix your histamine intolerance? We first have to diagnose it. But then once we diagnose it, I teach you in the book some of the strategies that you can use to ultimately overcome this. Right. So that's that's the key is that this is not about long term restriction into a low histamine diet permanently. This is about finding the problem. And now that we found it, cool, let's line it up. Let's line it up and fix it because we can make a targeted approach now that we know that you actually have this issue. I think that's great. You know, listen, one of the things I want to do, um, I mean, we, could, we could talk about this book more. I'd love to have you back and we can talk about specific um, uh, cooking techniques or specific ingredients uh, that you're talking about. But I, I want everyone to go out and buy the Fiber Fuel uh, Cookbook. Uh, you know, th this, this book actually is going to be something that um, you're going to, um, keep uh, nearby in your kitchen that you can refer to. And what I always tell people to do, when you find a cookbook you like, um, you can, here's a simple thing. This is what I do. I see a recipe I like, or I see a section of the cookbook. And I take a photograph with my cell phone. All right. If I can type a note into the notes section, that's great. But a lot of times I can't, I, I'm too busy or I've got some a lot of things, other things going. Take a picture of it. That way, the next time you're out shopping at the supermarket, you can just flip it open and you can go to the picture section and look at what you liked and you can just enlarge it and then buy what you need to buy. That's, that's kind of like my shorthand of taking of how do I work with cookbooks. Back in the old days, you had a Xerox it or you had to write a scrawl it down yourself. Now you just take a picture of it. It's, it's, it's super simple. But, if, you know, so what are, what are like in this whole cookbook, I want people to buy it. But like what are, what are some take home messages you want people to know? I mean, like even beyond the histamine chapter, what, what, there, are there are some things you want people to know. You delivered such a powerful message with the book Fiber Field. Now this is kind of the execution. This is the practice of, of Fiber Field. 
What are some take home messages you want people to know? I think, I think that there's two types of people and everyone fits into one of these two. By the way, there's only one group of people who really should definitely not buy my book. And that's if you're carnivore. If you're carnivore, I have zero ingredients for you in my book. Do not buy my book, please. Like, I would rather you not buy my book. Save the money and keep eating whatever you're going to eat. All right. There are two types of people. If you have gut health issues, there literally has never been a book exactly like this, right? This is a book actually designed as a protocol, chapter by chapter, to walk you through the process of healing that even gives you the recipes, the protocols that you need to emerge on the other side healthier, but on the flip side, there's going to be people who are like, but I have no health. I have no gut health issue, Dr. B. Why would I care if this is only for people with, with those issues? It's not. We have discovered that the gut microbiome is connected to your digestion, metabolism, immune system, hormones, mood, brain health, and energy levels. This is a precious commodity. It needs to be protected. It needs to be nurtured. If you're neglecting it and not paying attention to it, you're potentially putting your health at risk. The point is that we should be paying attention to this and eating in a way that lifts our gut microbes up so that we can enjoy the benefits that we get from that. This is more than just 125 recipes. This is more than just plant-based. These are recipes that were designed strategically to lift your gut microbiome up and make it healthier. So embedded in the recipes is plant diversity. Embedded in the book is a big section on fermentation and sprouting because those are some of the other techniques and strategies that we use for gut health. You know, what I, what I think you said is so powerful, which is our gut bacteria, you know, it's, it's not simply a concept that people are talking about, but they're literally organisms that are inside our body. I, I tell people that, you know, we're not even really known as humans anymore. We're known as holobionts. Uh, holobiont is an exactly. organism that's a combination of different organisms. And that's actually who we are. And, you know, and we have this great responsibility um, with our gut bacteria. They're, our gut bacteria are kind of like, uh, we have to feed them. We have to, you know, we give them room and board. The room is yep. in our gut. The board is the food that we feed them. And uh, we pay them well, they pay us back. So, you know, if you, how to think about your gut bacteria, it's, it's like if you, I mean, you know how to take care of it because if you have a cat, you have a dog, you have a goldfish, you have a parakeet, you think about feeding it every day, right? You feed, feed your right. pets because that's the right thing to do. And, and you don't just enjoy the, the, the pet and you don't take care of it. Like it's, it's a disaster. It gets sick and then it will, and, and you'll be disappointed. And that's the same thing that happens in our gut bacteria. We have to take care of our, our gut, uh, basically like our kids. We take care of our kids. So, you know, like you're talking about a guide to raising a, a good gut, essentially, uh, is what, what you're talking about. So real quick, uh, I saw someone comment that research says that they, they, they said that research says that fermented foods are more important than plant diversity. First of all, that's, that's definitely not true. There's no study that says that. If you're referring to the um, Stanford study, looking at fermented foods, that was not a comparison between fermented foods and plant diversity. That was not what they did. So you have to reread the study. The, the second thing is those are not mutually exclusive choices where you have to do one versus the other. You should do both which is why I included both in the book. They both are good for your gut microbiome. This is how we empower the gut microbes. So last thing real quick, Will, because I got to run. Um, you can buy my book anywhere. I appreciate anyone who wants to support my work and grab my book, no matter where you get it from. But at the same time, there, you could buy it from the place where the guy who owns it is worth $50 billion. Or alternatively, you could hop in your car and roll down to that local small bookstore in your community where it is owned by your neighbor and they probably have been struggling because of the pandemic and you <clears throat> you slide a twenty dollar bill across the table to them and they slide a copy of the fiber fields cookbook to you and you go home and you feel great because you got a great book but you also supported a local business that needs your help right now i am i am so <coughs> I'm, I'm so behind that message Tell everyone where they can actually find more information about you. All right. So if you come to my website, it's theplantfedgut.com. That's my website. And um, if you do theplantfedgut.com slash cookbook, not only will you find all of the available places to buy my book, but you could also, if you really want to, if you're excited about my work, you can buy a signed copy. And um, it's actually a, a partnership I'm doing with my local bookstore. I'm not making any money. I'm just signing books. 
And, um, and then also uh, there's bonus assets. So in those bonus assets, you got a food diary, you got worksheets for high histamine foods, high FODMAP foods, substitutions, basically trying to empower you with as much information as I can. That is fantastic. I'm telling you, I'm going to go up after this and I'm going to sign up and download that information myself as a follow-up to this conversation. And uh, just so everyone knows, I've also created um, some new material for people who want to learn how to eat to beat disease. Come to my website, it's Dr. William, D-R-WilliamLee-L-I.com. You can see, find me on social. It's on the link of my bio. Um, uh, I want to have new information for people to actually learn how, um, what kind of ingredients are good. And what's great news is that if you were to kind of compare our notes Will Bolsowitz, Dr. B, we actually, our, our ideas are very, very synchronous, which is that our gut microbiome is one of the ways that our body defends itself, defends its health. And when we feed our gut well, it pays us back with good health. So thank you very much for joining me today. And I'm looking forward to having you back. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Will. Thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us today. And uh, this was awesome, man. There, people were super into it. So we'll definitely have to do it again sometime. Cool. All right. See, ya. See you guys. Bye. Take care.